Buckle your seatbelt. It's time for another episode of the Prepper Recon Podcast. Ready-Made Resources is a trusted name in the Prepper community because they've been around for 18 years. They offer great prices on night vision, water filtration, long-term storage food, solar energy components, and provide free technical service. Get ready for an uncertain future at ReadyMadeResources.com. Get prepared before disaster strikes. PrepperRecon.com offers Molly-compatible individual first aid kits for your home, auto, or bug-out bag. These kits have everything you need to address a traumatic injury, including an Israeli battle dressing, quick clot, EMT shears, suture kit, steri strips, tourniquet, tough strip bandages, and so much more. Kits are available in OD Green, Coyote, Black, and ACU. $99 includes shipping. Go to PrepperRecon.com and click the Store tab at the top of the home page. Order to today before it's too late today's guest is brian 80 author of the adventure of a lifetime brian welcome to the show well thanks for having me mark oh absolutely it's a pleasure to have you on uh what first woke you up to the need to prepare so um i had been told that i might like a book called one second after and i got it from the local library and started reading it and i had this moment of realization that if anything remotely like happened in the book happened in real life, I would not make it. Um, I, I didn't even have a concept. I mean, I had a concept, I guess, back to Y2K of, you know, th- things might go bad. Um, I think my idea then as a as a teenager was I got a couple cans of Sterno and I was like, I'll hunt for food and things like that, but I never really processed. But once I read uh, the the One Second After book, I thought, I needed to take this seriously, Um, and so I started uh, getting into preparedness a lot more, uh, building skills as well as preps. Yeah, and I think that 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 thought of of the life-changing event of an EMP is just – it's just something that a lot of people – it's just – it's so daunting because that is, you know, uh, financial collapse. Okay, we got to learn how to barter or whatever. But man, no yeah. no electricity, no water, no food, no nothing. That's that's really, really big. And uh, and I think it scares a lot of people to just stick on their head in the sand. But uh, good for you. You didn't do that. You you took the high road and you said, okay, well, let's start thinking through this and, and figure out what I can do about it. So – Tell us a little bit about your new book. It's a it's a beautiful book, by the way, The Adventure oh, of a Lifetime. You. I'm looking at the cover right now. It's this great looking cover, great looking book. Tell us a little bit about it. So um, the the book came about actually as a, a thought exercise. Um, you know, I, I I like to think through different scenarios, and I, I was thinking through, you know, um, what would I need to survive long term in the wilderness? And out of that thought process, um, the, the story was kind of born almost by accident. You know, I wasn't intending to write a story, um, but I, I shaped this thought exercise around a character um, named Ryan McQuaid. And, you know, the, the basic storyline is he's, he's had it. He's dissatisfied with life. He's in a job he doesn't like. Um, his coworkers don't get him. He's not even sure he gets himself. So he figures, you know what? I'm going to do something crazy. I'm going to go on an Alaskan adventure in the wilderness. I'm going to live it up. Uh, but he gets a lot more than he bargained for. Um, his adventure starts a little early. He ends up stranded um, basically in any direction at the very bare minimum 60 miles from civilization. But in reality, it's closer to about 150 miles away from any civilization. And he's got to use his skills and his gear to survive and to try to make his way back to civilization. Um, and the character, Ryan, um, he's not the survival expert. Um, he's got a decent knowledge base, but he's not the guru that's going to have the TV show. So he's going to make mistakes in the story. Uh, I, I put stuff in there on purpose. I want readers to read through and say, what are you doing? Or, no, that's not what you need to do. Or, I would have done this differently. Um, so it's a story I want the readers to interact with, and I want them to think through, what would I do in this kind of scenario? So that's really what got me to write the story, and that's the basic storyline. Well, it's a fantastic premise for a book. Now, have you ever personally been camping in Alaska? I have not. It's actually been a, a childhood dream of mine, um, and some acquaintances of mine went on a hunting trip up to the region where the story's based, the North Slope Brooks Range region of Alaska. Um, so, you know, I got to hear reports, see pictures and I was pretty jealous, (laughs) um, but it is a a dream of mine. I'd like to, at some point in life, go on an extended adventure up in Alaska. 
and and Alaska can be a very unforgiving wilderness, and I guess that's why there's so many TV shows and survival stories that are that are based there. Uh, there's uh, I think it's Discovery Channel or maybe it's Nat Geo. They they've got the Mountain Men and they've got the the trapper yes. that goes to Alaska, and then of course uh, Into the Wild. Now that's uh, that's really extreme. Where yeah, the, the guy just went to live to. And not to live, to die in the bus. Yes, with the that's bag of a rice. Story gone wrong. Yeah, and uh, the, the last frontier. Um, and uh, Sarah Palin even had her own show. Just, just all she had to do is show what it's like to live in Alaska, <laughs> and, and and that's a TV show. Yeah, um, and you know, you read a lot of stories or hear a lot of things like that about how hard it is. Um, I have a feeling that they just scratch the surface on what they actually show there. I, I, I get the feeling from what I've you know heard from people who've been there. It's a lot more unforgiving than we even think it is. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. KD Armor offers affordable body armor, including level three trauma plates made of AR-500 steel. These plates can endure multiple rounds from pistols and rifles up to 7.62 NATO. Use coupon code PREPPERRECON to get 10% off your entire order at katiearmor.com. That's C-A-T-I armor.com. It's Sunday night. A busy work week is just around the corner. Then suddenly your lights won't turn on. Your phone stops working. Are you ready for what tomorrow could bring? Come to the Atlanta Preparedness Expo. Learn about solar power, communications, emergency water, long-term food storage, survival kits, bug-out bags, concealed carry, grab-and-go medical kits, suture classes, experts on-site at the Atlanta Preparedness Expo. April 23rd and 24th, Cobb Galleria Center, Atlanta, Georgia. I've personally been buying gold and silver from JM Bullion for over two years. They offer the best prices over spot that I can find, and I've never had a problem with an order. If you're looking to trade in some of your fiat paper for real money, check out jmbullion.com today. Yeah, I live like, uh, I've moved a little further north, but uh, before I was like, I don't know, like a mile and a half from the equator. So, you know, we had a real <laughs> steady uh, 12 hours of light and 12 hours of, uh, of night year round. And so I think that that would probably boggle my mind having light all, you know, the sun not going down in the in the winter and then in the summer rather, and then uh, complete darkness in the winter. I think that would, that would really freak me out. I would, I'd have a lot of trouble with the, 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 lack of uh daylight and darkness yeah it screws a lot of people up from what i understand from people i've talked to that have lived up there as far as insomnia goes it's just getting used to those cycles we're we're not really you know most of us we live with you know 12 hours of daylight 12 hours darkness or you know 16 hours of daylight eight hours of darkness depending upon the season we're just not used to that kind of different light cycle and uh, now your characters in the book, they have to rely real heavily on bushcraft skills in the book. Is that right? Yes. And, and talk, yeah. to us, talk to us a little bit about bushcraft. How would you define the word bushcraft to somebody that's new to the prepper community that's not really familiar with, with, with what we're talking about if we say bushcraft? Okay. Um, I'm going to open a can of worms here because to, to people that are in the bushcraft community, this is a discussion that um, may at times lead to some angry words and name calling and whatnot. Uh, but I, I think that the general idea of bushcraft is it goes beyond just survival skills. It's more, um, I guess I'd call it thrival uh, It's getting into nature and working with nature and instead of viewing um, the environment or the outdoors is something to put up with and survive. It's it's learning how to adapt to and use those environmental uh, things to your advantage. So in bushcraft, we'd be using more, I think, natural shelters, uh, more natural fire materials, um, really just using what the environment gives you instead of bringing a lot of outside synthetic things into it. And let's say let's say that uh, you're a teacher. Uh, let's say that you had a weekend camp class, and uh, and you had a, a group of people um, for a weekend, and you could teach them three bushcraft skills. What would you teach them? Okay. Um, well, I would say the most essential skill is firecraft. Um, it, it, fire is the number one thing at, in the outdoors. Uh, that you know helps you purify water to cook food to keep warm and it's a big morale booster. Um, I would say the the first skill I would teach would probably be wood selection. It doesn't sound you know super 
high speed, low drag. But if you can't select the proper wood, you're going to frustrate yourself to no end. Um, and when I was learning this skill, I, I learned a lot by trial and error. Uh, but I, I would say that for someone who's never been out, you know, when I used to make fires before I learned this, I, I would pick wood up off the ground. Uh, but the number one thing I would tell you is pick wood that is off the ground, dead branches that are, you know, the, the tree is dead uh, or the branch is thoroughly dead. So there's no moisture in it and it's up off the ground so it doesn't soak up moisture. So that'd be the first skill I would teach. Um, I think the, the second skill that I would teach is, you know, it's, it's really fun, but making shavings uh, to start your fire with. Just you, you take your, your knife and you make fine wood shavings um, instead of just trying to find branches or trying to, you know, douse the stuff that you put on the ground to make your fire with, with lighter fluid, if you make fine wood shavings, just one touch from a match oftentimes will get that fire going. And it's a really exhilarating experience for someone who's never done it. For someone who thinks that you need um, accelerants to start a fire, if they make wood shavings and start their own fire, uh, I've, I've seen people like jump up and down when they get it. They're so excited. Um, and I think... A third skill that's really essential would just be shelter making, Uh, something so simple. It it doesn't, again, a lot of this sounds mundane, but when you actually get out in the woods and you get it right, it's so rewarding. Um, Shelter making, like learning how to tie uh, a taut line hitch or a double half hitch knot to secure your shelter, it doesn't sound like it's going to be very rewarding. But as someone who's had a shelter fall down on them because I didn't know how to tie a proper knot, I can tell you being able to sleep the night through without your tarp falling down on you because you tied the right knot, it's very rewarding. And, and knots, that's something you have to practice, isn't it? Because, I mean, you can learn a knot and then uh, if you don't use it and you go to try to, oh, yeah, I, I know the perfect knot for that. Now, what was it? Was the, the rabbit goes up the <laughs> hole, around a tree, behind some bushes, and, and then there's another rabbit and – and and you know what happens when there's two rabbits? <laughs> yeah, then they start multiplying, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I you know actually it's something simple. I have a little piece of paracord that I keep with me at work um, in my desk, and you know on lunchtime I take five minutes, maybe sometimes just two minutes, and I'll practice a knot or two, and it helps me keep my knots up. And it really, if you learn four knots that you can do well, it's way better than trying to memorize, you know, 80 or hundred knots. If, if you just learn four very basic knots and practice them, you know, once a week, once every other week, it, it's very simple to keep up with. And then, and then maybe as a little caveat, uh, like texting, don't practice your knot tying while you're driving. <laughs> yeah. You don't want to do that, especially if you end up all tied up. Um, I don't think the, the police or your fellow motorist would, would view that very kindly. And, and on the, uh, uh, now we mentioned before you're a teacher, and uh, I guess I guess you see a lot of texting with with the kids. Yes. Uh, is our society just oversaturated by gadgets, and and have they lost touch with with nature, especially as you see the younger generation coming up? Uh, what, what's your take on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we we have training every year uh, before the school year starts, and I believe that the stat that was given um, this past year was the average student um, our age that we teach, which would be uh, between 14 and 18, they spend about 12 hours of their day in front of a screen. Now, that does count uh, multiple devices at once, so they may have their cell phone out, um, and the time's ticking on that, as well as their laptop out or their iPad. Um, but they they spend an inordinate amount of time tied to devices. Um, it's to the point where uh, they've, there's been another study that I've I've read, which kind of scared me. The average teenager would rather go without necessities of life, um, including like water, um, a toothbrush, deodorant. They'd rather go without like hygiene tools or even water, um, as opposed to going without Wi-Fi. So uh, this this is something really like if you're wanting to engage someone, getting them into the outdoors, getting them in, in you know, just out of that environment. I think it's you know, short trips would be useful, like a short hike, but it really gets them to disconnect from their devices, which I think to some extent it's it's really damaging. Just to throw another stat out, I found this astounding. Um, Dr. Stephen Alardi, he's a premier psychologist, and he said that projections are that this generation is right now currently 
uh, kids under 18, 25 percent of them have had a, a major clinical depression episode. And it's projected that in their lifetime, 50 percent of them will. Whereas in the generation around 1900, in their lifetime, about 4 percent of people would. So this being tied to their devices is, is an antisocial thing where they feel like they don't have friends. They connect through media. And it's really having not just a physical effect but a psychological effect as well. And, and do you think just getting out and getting some sunshine and some fresh air, do you think that would help a lot of that? Absolutely. Um, I, I think that even something so simple as, as going on a walk, you know, a 15, 20-minute walk, um, especially if you can get out, you know uh, – there are parks everywhere where they have trails, um, but even just if you can't, if there's not a park by you, you know, just getting outside, getting some sunshine would be great. But getting out, I think, into into creation, getting out into nature, uh, I think, just has a, an even more invigorating effect, where you you start to pay attention to things you didn't realize were there before. You notice the the veins in the leaves, um, the pattern of the bark, um, the sounds of the animals. Uh, just things that you wouldn't experience otherwise that really, I think, deepen our appreciation for what's out there. And what would you say to the person that says they're just too busy and, and they don't they don't have time to get outdoors? Um, I would say, I mean, it, it may sound pat, but I, I think that if you make time, you're going to realize you have more time. Um, if you take the 20 minutes, you know, one day a week or two days a week to get out in the outdoors – the time that you do have is going to be far more productive. Um, I just I noticed that with myself. I've got two small kids. Um, I've got a full time job. I've got responsibilities around the house, um, you know, and I have further other responsibilities as well. And I also I run on I run two to three days a week, and then I try to get in the outdoors on a regular basis as well. And I find when like when I don't do those things. I'm far less productive. My mind is far less focused. So I'd say the time that you do have, if you do invest a little extra time, it's going to be more productive, more rewarding time. And uh, a little more personal, if you were being left for dead in the middle of the woods, uh, maybe uh, Chris, uh, I can't remember his last name, the kid, the in, into the wild kid. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah I can't. It, it, and uh, you were going to live in the magic bus. Uh, what What five items would you take with you? Okay. Um, definitely a, a knife, a good knife. Um, it doesn't have to be a super expensive knife, by the way. Fixed blade or folding? Uh, fixed blade. Absolutely fixed blade. I mean, I could get by with a folding, um, but they're a lot more fragile than a, a, a fixed blade knife. So um, full even tang? something full. Absolutely. I mean, if I, if I had to be like, I, I've got nice knives. I've got a couple custom knives, um, I've also got a Mora knife I would trust my life with, which is a $15 knife. Um, so, uh, but if I had, if, if you, if I could pick anything, I would pick a full tang fixed blade knife. Um, and I would pick, um, second thing would definitely be a fire steel. You know, someone might say, well, why wouldn't you take a pack of matches? But with a, a decent sized fire steel, um, I can get 12,000 to 15,000 strikes, you know, box of matches, even if I take a big box, I've got like 200 matches in there. Um, so I would take a, a knife. I would take a fire steel, um, some kind of poncho, you know, something to keep the elements off of me that I could also use as like maybe a tarp for a shelter. Um, some kind of sleeping bag that you know to, to keep me warm. Um, and then I would take some kind of water carrying device, typically probably something metal. So that I could boil water, like I could boil my water over the fire in it um, for purification. But those would be five things that I would take. Um, it, I, I could maybe see me, possibly, if I knew I was going like to Arizona in the middle of the summer, I could maybe leave the sleeping bag. But th those would be, I think, the essentials there. Very cool. Now, uh, what part of the country are you in? Um, I'm in Western Pennsylvania. And. Uh how would the bushcraft skills that you would use in your region, how would they be different from, from uh, what your characters use in the adventure of a lifetime in Alaska? Um, okay. So there, there would be some differences. I would say um, just, I put in my author's note, I did insert some trees, some areas of trees in the storyline that probably wouldn't be there. Um, just so, because I'm so used to a, a 
like a mix of coniferous and deciduous forest. Uh, but I would say um, they're going to rely on firecraft a lot more on on a typical like in, they're out in Alaska in the summertime, but it's still cold. On a typical summer night, if I can't start a fire, I'm not going to die in Pennsylvania. It's nice to have, but I can get by without it. Um, and also, I think there's just such an overabundance of wood and, quite frankly, of wildlife in my area that I'm not going to starve. And I could burn a fire in the same you know 100-square-foot radius probably for a week before I ran out of firewood. Um, so they're going to have to – the characters in the story, they're going to have to husband their materials very well. Um, they're going to have to to make the most with their wood that they can. Um, they're going to have to use their fire to keep hypothermia away, whereas for me it would just be a nice thing to have. Um, and they're going to have to really deal with learning to cope with not eating at times, whereas there are so many wild edibles around in the summertime where I'm at that if I go hungry, it's my fault. Awesome. And uh, on on that note, uh, is foraging is that part of bushcraft? Are we gonna are we gonna tick off any of the purists if we if we say that foraging is uh, is bushcraft? No, I, I would say foraging is absolutely a part of bushcraft. Whether it's just it, it, you know for, for your fire starting materials or more like for food, I, I would say that's at the heart of bushcraft. Um, I think that learning learning some plant identification is is very essential. Um, especially if you're going to if you're wanting to forage you know it's it's one thing if you make a mistake on plant identification if you're harvesting firewood and you thought oh i, I was going to harvest you know box elder and i accidentally harvested elm you know the wood's going to be a little harder but if you're wanting to harvest um some wild edible like you want to harvest wild onions there's a very toxic equivalent or like wild carrots and you end up getting um hemlock you know poison hemlock instead those are fatal mistakes so I would say it's it, foraging is awesome. It's a lot of fun, um, but I would start with the very easily identifiable stuff, you know, like raspberries, blackberries, dewberries. Um, the the berries are generally very easy to identify and a, a whole lot tastier, I think. Um, but I think it's a it's a very fun skill because you know if you're out with your family and you see some wild raspberries and you pick them and eat them while you're going along, it, it's just I think it adds an extra level of enjoyment to your your hike. Absolutely. That's very, very cool. It sounds like a really, really exciting read. Uh, I've got my copy. Uh, I'm waiting to get through the book that I'm working on right now to uh, have a little time to sit down and read it, but uh, looking forward to it. Uh, where do people go to find your book? Um, it's available on Amazon.com. Um, if they type in the title, The Adventure of a Lifetime, um, there apparently are some songs that have that title, so I'm a little bit down uh, they have to scroll like five or six selections down, or if they type in my name, Brian Ady, um, it's A D E Y. Um, I'm the first option that comes up, and it's available as a an ebook through the Kindle, or it's also available as a paperback. Brian, thanks so much for making time to talk to us today. Oh, thanks so much for having me on. In Seven Cows, Ugly and Gaunt, Book One, Behold Darkness and Sorrow, Daniel Walker begins having prophetic dreams about the judgment coming upon America for rejecting God's word. Through one of his dreams, Daniel learns of an imminent threat of an electromagnetic pulse attack sending the country into a technological dark age. If they want to live, Daniel and his friends must focus on faith with and preparation to be ready before the lights go out. Buy your copy of Seven Cows, Ugly and Gaunt, Book One, Behold Darkness and Sorrow, by best-selling author Mark Goodwin, in paperback, Kindle, or audio edition from Amazon.com.